Well, that was easy. Um, this log didn't want to give up its life, and I think the reason it didn't, it didn't realize that it's a table. Well, going to be a table. So we um, we often think of things like we're doing, like our cabin build and the furniture I'm starting now for the interior as rustic. And I'm pretty confident that a pioneer living on the frontier didn't even have the word rustic in his vocabulary. He simply looked at things as practical, made what he could from the land with the tools he had at hand. Um, but I'm going to take a break from this now and the cabin build for a week or two. Um, I'm heading off on a trek, and I thought... Uh, because once I get trekking, I'm not going to do a lot of talking. I just thought I'd go over um, the items that a person living in the 1700s would take on a winter's trek for survival. So you can see the cabin isn't quite finished, but if one assumed it was, and it was nice and tight, and there was a fire going inside, and I could smell the stew pot cooking on the fire, you'd wonder what would compel anyone to go off into the wilderness in the middle of winter. So a couple of reasons, good reasons, would be hunger. So they basically required a large game to survive the winter. And if they depleted that in the area, they would have to travel to find that. That would be the primary reason. And certainly in the time frame, uh, they might be called up for militia duty, not likely in the winter, but quite possibly. So those would be a couple of good reasons. So. I'm about to head off on, on a trek before winter's gone. We're starting to get to spring now. We're into March. And I thought I'd cover the things that a settler would carry for survival um, in that time period. So, And I thought I'd prioritize it somewhat. So the first, first thing is fire starting. So I, I carry a tinder bag, and it's a, um, basically a pill tick bag. I beeswaxed it. It's a it's pretty watertight. Inside it, I have a little horn I made, and inside that I have some char cloth and a bit of chaga. So that's my fire starting part. And because I maybe find myself in really inclement conditions, I pre-make my bird's nests. So I got about six of them in there. So I'm using tow, which is basically the scrapings from, of flax from the linen floors. And inside I put bits of uh, cedar and some birch bark and stuff I know is going to catch pretty quick. So that primary one, I carry two. I carry one in my haversack for day fires if I need them, which I don't usually have. But that gets rolled up inside my bedroll to keep it dry. I also carry a burning glass in a tinder box. So I can put my chag in there and a different tinder and drop a spark in it. I can also use the burning glass. And on a day like today, it's really sunny today. There's not a cloud in the sky. Burning glass will start a fire really quickly. Essential to it is flint and steel. And I make my own um, strikers and I make sure I harden them to the point that if, if I were to drop it on a, on a brick or a, a stone, it would actually break. But I get a great shower of sparks from that. So. That's essentially my fire starting kit. In a pinch, um, if your uh, flintlock isn't loaded, you can um, put a bit of uh, tinder toe in that, sprinkle a tad of black powder on it, and, and, and dry fire the musket, and you'll get fire that way as well. So that sort of is, is I, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is the most essential part of trekking. So whether I've got wool blankets or I lose them or whatever happens, as long as I can make fire, I'll survive. So the next most important uh, part of winter trekking and essential uh, is the snowshoe. Um, without it, you, you simply would wallow and get totally exhausted in, in no time at all. We did a moose hunt uh, two or three winters ago, quite a ways in, up in northern Ontario. And the snow, even with snowshoes on, the snow was coming over our knees, mid-thigh. Quite exhausting even, even at that. But without them, one simply couldn't have moved. Um, these are quite old. These, these snowshoes might be upwards of 100 years old. Um, they make modern ones that are traditional style, wooden. Uh, they don't have this fine weave. And these have excellent flotation. They're just a great pair of snowshoes. So next up in importance um, for doing this type of adventure, one might think it's the gun um, to harvest game to feed yourself. Um, you can go a long time without food, but you can't survive in minus uh, sub temperatures without fire. So 
Next up is the axe. And I've made uh, uh, in the blacksmith shop a number of pole axes and, and what have you um, that are fine for three season camping. But for winter time, when you need a lot of firewood, and, and I do mean a lot, um, the axe is essential. And next comes the musket, which I'll cover, cover right now. So I mentioned one doesn't need food. You can live a long time without it, but I do like to eat. So next is the musket. I prefer the smooth bore. I have uh, a couple of rifled muskets, but much more versatile. I can shoot either shot, which I carry in my shot pouch here, or I can carry round ball, which I'll show you what I carry in, um, in my shooting bag. So this is a typical size of a shooting bag in the time period. And in this pouch, I carry everything I, that requires for uh, shooting the gun, either round ball, shot, uh, cleaning and maintenance of the gun is also important. So I've got a little pouch with uh, about a dozen round balls in it. Carry a bit of rag for cleaning it, which can double, I can cut that for patch material. I carry a small flint, flint wallet. And inside it, I basically have not as much as I would have back at home in the cabin, but I have the essentials for maintenance. So I've got a small pair of pliers. I have a turn screw tool. I have my toe worm and bullet puller. And I carry three extra flints. So that covers the basically the maintenance of the gun. Uh, contrary to popular belief, they didn't pour powder right from the horn. And this isn't quite period correct for the century uh, that I'm portraying, but it's a powder measure, so I can measure out powder for different charges. I also carry a bullet mold and a small bit of lead that I can melt and cast more balls if it's required when I'm in the field. I also carry a small piece of snare wire in it. So we have a great population of rabbits this year. And if one puts out five, six, seven sets, you're guaranteed one or two rabbits at night so that's pretty cool i also carry a compass so there are people out there that think they have a, a natural ability to navigate in the forest and i can attest from being lost more than once or twice that that, that isn't true i don't think anyone really has that ability uh, so the compass is essential on a day like today when it's perfectly sunny one can navigate by recognizing where the sun is in the sky and Basically, you know, east, west, north, south, and one can get along quite well, but on an overcast day, that's essential. So that basically covers uh, the, what I need to uh, um, maintain the musket, load the musket. When I depart, I take along uh, a full flask. My horn here, it, uh, it carries pretty close to a pound of powder, which I've never used the entire, powder, or entire horn, so it's more than adequate. Other accoutrements I carry, I always have my, my neck knife sheath on. Uh, it's pretty handy, but it's the one thing I do carry a spare. So I carry my long knife as well. Um, knife's probably one of the most useful tools in a camp once you get to camp. And uh, if I were to lose one, I have a, I have a backup. So I'm going to go over to my um, bedroll next, and I'll talk about that, and my kitchen gear. And that'll pretty much cover everything. So I always carry a minimum of two blankets and with two blankets, I'm able to roll them up and get them on my, my solo toboggan that I've built here. Um, got a lot of friends down there in the middle ground, Tennessee, people who portray the long hunter that have all these single wool blanket tricks. And I assure you, it does not work in Northern Ontario. Uh, one simply wouldn't survive. So two blankets go on the toboggan and if I know it's gonna be really cold, I'll carry a third and a bedroll on my back. Try to avoid that if I can, but sometimes it's essential. So inside the blanket, it's going to go on the toboggan. These are the things I carry. The fire starting tinder kit I talked about, heavy gloves, a spare pair of woolen mitts, a toque, a woolen toque, a spare pair of moccasins. Uh, when you get to camp, it's pretty much uh, there, there's no question your feet are going to be cold and often wet. So dry moccasins go on, the pair you're wearing gets dried. And then my food bag. So my market wallet contains um, different foodstuffs, 
I carry it in different bags. So I've got, you know, my Bannock mix. I've got uh, only foods they would have had in that time period. So nothing modern. I carry some jerky in case I'm unsuccessful snaring rabbits, um, what have you. So all the food goes in the bag. This all gets rolled up. Everything's watertight uh, or reasonably so. And when I arrive at camp, and then last, before I show you how I pack, is my bit, is my haversack. So inside it, I carry my kitchen gear, basically. So I've got coffee pot. I carry a small folding handle frying pan. Build a little canvas bag for it so it doesn't blacken everything. I simply cut a stick for that when I get to camp, and uh, that serves me quite well. If I'm going really light and I have to carry it all on my back, I won't carry a pot. I'll just... Uh, or I won't carry the frying pan, I'll simply take a pot, the smallest copper pot I have. I also won't take that, um, or a cup. You can get by with simply one pot, but yeah, when I can use a toboggan, I don't like my coffee tasting greasy, and uh, I've drank some pretty bad co coffee out of the pot, the stew pot. Uh, carry an extra bedroll strap, that's if I'm carrying the third blanket. I always carry my tump line, my 20-foot Tump line, which I can bring in bundles of firewood. I can also use it to string my shelter. What else we got here? A blanket pin. So when I'm rolling up this blanket, once I get the second blanket uh, laid out, I'll roll them up. So this goes forward, the other one goes down, and essentially I end up with six layers of wool over my feet, which get coldest first. I reverse the blankets, which are a little awkward to get in and out of, but that stops the draft. So the opening is open opening on the one side and the bl uh, second blanket opens on the other side. So a little awkward getting in and out of, but seems to work pretty good. A uh, little kitchen set with a knife and a spoon in it. And I think we pretty much covered it. And when I can carry it and have the space and don't like greasy coffee, I carry a clean tin cup. Inside of the haversack, I have a, a tray, my, my um, sorry, my capote. And I have that on my back and close at hand. So if I do get cold while I'm walking, I can quickly open it up and access that. I also carry my um, trade blanket. Um, and it uh, it's good when I'm sitting around camp or if I got to stop, I can put it in a snow covered log and I got something to sit on. As far as the haversack goes, I've been at living history for decades and I have probably built 20 different types or styles of haversack. And I finally got one that I absolutely love. So it, this will go much bigger if I need to. It's got two pouches, one on the front, one on the back. It has a single strap. And a lot of people like the knapsack or double strap ones and they can be historically documented. But I find once they're on your back, they're in one position. This one I can change from shoulder to shoulder while I'm walking without setting my musket down. I can also carry it like a tump line on my forehead, so it works quite well. So last, I'll show you how I pack the, the um, toboggan, and then I'm gonna get this kit ready and I'm gonna go trekking. So what I do is I roll my blankets so they fit here and here. Um, I essentially take my shelter or tarp. Sometimes I don't even take a tarp. Um, but yeah, with the toboggan, it's quite handy. So I'll roll the tarp out, leave it laid out, put my two bed rolls on top, fold the tarp over top. Before I uh, set it all down, I put a couple of tie downs underneath uh, my cargo straps and the toboggan, and basically the whole thing gets lashed down. And uh, yeah, I'm off. So to, um, to sum up, I'll, I'll talk about a, a couple of the techniques that I use when I'm historic trekking in the winter. Um, because once I get out there, um, if you're gonna follow in the next video, you won't see or hear a lot, a lot of talking because I'm going there for that reason, for the silence and the solitude. Uh, so fire-wise, you don't have this little ringed rock fire. I build fires that are five to six feet long. Uh, I lay parallel to them. I bring in a massive amount of firewood. I try to bring in more firewood than, I, than I'm going to need because I did run out one time and it wasn't pleasant. I don't chop it into little blocks like firewood. I leave it as long as I can haul to the camp and it's right by my head when I'm sleeping. So essentially I just gotta get a shoulder out of the bedroll and grab one of these long chunks and slide it into the coals. And that helps me get through the night without getting chilled. Um, Bow-wise, when I'm building my bed, uh, I try to get a good two feet. 
because come morning that's going to be down to a foot and if it's sub-zero temperatures you need at least a foot insulation between you and the ground or you're going to have a pretty uncomfortable night and lastly the risks of winter camping are certainly greater than summer camping when one goes solo those risks increase again and when you're going solo using only the accoutrements that they would have had in the uh, 18th century you've taken that risk to an even higher level so you have to be careful you have to be slow you have to think about what you're doing because you're, there's not going to be anybody there, there to give you a hand anyway i'm going to get this stuff all uh, packed up rolled up tied down to this here toboggan and i'm heading uh, off to the north for a few days of solitude